the U.S. Supreme Court is about to decide a hugely important gun rights case that gets at the practical meaning of the Second Amendment. Cases about New York State's discretionary license law for firearms, and yes, like you, I'd like to know what discretionary licensing means and whether it's coming to my neck of the woods. And this question has gotten even more interesting in view of the Ukraine war, where their universally armed citizenry seems to have made a huge impact on the course of events there. We'll talk about these issues in some depth on this episode of Independent Conversation. Hello, everybody. I'm Graham Walker coming to you from the Independent Institute in California. We're right across the bay from San Francisco. And our goal is to bring you insight on the issues of the day in a way that takes its cues more from evidence than from popularity. And to talk about today's Second Amendment issues, I am extremely pleased to welcome Independent Institute scholar and senior fellow Stephen Halbrook. Welcome. Oh, glad to be on the show, Graham. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's really a pleasure. And, you know, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a moment uh, to brag briefly about your credentials, Dr. Halbrook. And I'm saying Dr. Halbrook because, after all, you, you did earn a PhD in philosophy from Florida State University. You, you can just Dr. call me Halbrook. Steve on the show. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Steve, I will try yeah. that out. Steve. Okay. Steve Halbrook <clears throat> is a senior fellow with the Independent Institute. Uh, he has taught at some interesting universities, including George Mason University, Howard University in D.C., Tuskegee Institute. Uh, and you have argued three cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. I bet that was a challenge. Well, it would seem to be. But when you're actually there, if you've been with the case for years, you really know more than anybody in the courtroom about that issue. Uh, Even the justices. Oh, yeah. Probably. Oh, definitely the justices. <clears throat> Well, if you can handle them, you can handle this then today, yep. right, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> so people may also have seen you elsewhere. Um, you've published in the Wall Street Journal, San Francisco Chronicle, National Review, USA Today. You've been on Fox News, CNN, Voice of America, C-SPAN, et cetera. Here at the Independent Institute, we are especially proud of having Steve Halbrick as one of our authors. I mean, there are all these books. I have a little pile of them right here. Um, uh, this is quite a remarkable book, Securing Civil Rights, um, very much worth reading. Um, another book uh, was Gun Control and the Third Reich, obvious implications for today, and then followed up by Gun Control and Nazi Occupied France, where apparently the occupiers knew how to use gun control to their advantage. Another book, <clears throat> The Founder's Second Amendment, really the definitive book, on the origins of the right to bear arms in the U.S. Constitution. And then, most recently, <clears throat> I don't know, a couple months ago, not too long ago, uh, we published the book, The Right to Bear Arms, which has this wonderful subtitle, Steve, A Constitutional Right of the People or a Privilege of the Ruling Class. Uh, I highly recommend people take a look at these books. They're available on our website, independent.org, and wherever you get your books. So, okay. Uh, Steve, th this case that the Supreme Court's about to uh, make a decision on, or at least issue their ruling on, probably next month, it's called uh, New York State. Give me the name of the case, please. New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. And Bruin is New York State's what exactly? <clears throat> He's a defendant, uh, an official who denied licenses to the litigants in the case. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. So the court has already held hearings on this, right? The court had oral argument, I think, November the 3rd, if I'm recalling that correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a very interesting argument. It did not go well for New York. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, so you were present that day and you heard them talking, I'm guessing. Well, they, it was, the court was closed to human bodies because of COVID. Oh, and in right, fact, right. Um, <laughs> I think by then they were letting the lawyers in and maybe a limited press and the justices were there um i mean last year before that the 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 last term um they were doing it by audio by telephone mm -hmm. and so people were in their own offices Oof, wow. and the, the justices wow. were wherever they were calling from yeah that was awkward well it, it actually was more um procedurally more regular because in the old huh. days when you go to the court and you argue the case the judges are constantly interrupting you they're interrupting so i've heard interrupting each other 
Um, like I'm interrupting you right now. Exactly. <laughs> um, one of my favorite times in the court was 1997, arguing Prince versus U.S. when Justice Breyer started going on and on about why don't we do things like in the European countries and and Justice Scalia cut him off and he said, we're construing our constitution, not theirs. Um, <laughs> but when they started going by telephone, they went by seniority, having each justice ask questions for a certain number of minutes. Um, and then the response to that. So there was no cutting people off. There was no oh. argument with the judges between the justices and Justice Thomas had questions every time. And I mean, I've seen him in open court ask questions anyway. It it was rare, but he, when he asked a question, Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a really good question and it was good to hear his voice and good to hear hear him participating that way. Well, in a few minutes, I want to come back uh, and really delve into that case of the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, if I've got the name right. But before we go back there, I mean, your comment a moment ago, you know, about we're construing our constitution, not theirs, makes me think of the fact that, you know, there's a whole world out there. And right now we're not speaking as Supreme Court justices, we're citizens here, uh, Steve. And so, you know, you and I uh, can't help noticing that in world news right now, there's been a lot of attention paid to the fact that the widespread uh, availability of private use of firearms in Ukraine has made a huge difference um, in apparently in the outcome of the war there. Um, you wrote a piece on this uh, for the Washington Times in at the very end of March, and we've reposted it to our website, independent.org. Your title was Ukraine War Reintroduces U.S. Politicians to the Second Amendment, which of course implies that they needed to be reintroduced. Yeah, let me tell you a little bit of background. Um, but before yeah, there was this war, uh, you know, <clears throat> The Soviet Union broke up, Ukraine became independent, but they inherited the Russian gun laws. And so people who were favorites of the party, the Communist Party, could get firearms. Um, And when they became independent, they did not enact a a statute, though, um, about who gets guns and how they get them, what are the legal standards. And in fact, they had huge stores of firearms, and the government would give them out to favored people. Um, and so if you, you know, maybe paid the right bribe to the right official, you could get guns. And then the Obama administration pressured them to destroy a lot of their stores of, uh, of arms, which they did some of, got rid of the nukes. Um, anyway, things were kind of moving along, and I got a surprise invitation in the year 2013 from the Ukrainian Law Review to contribute a piece on the Second Amendment. They were doing a an issue of their law review, a complete issue on the American Bill of Rights. And so that that showed you something interesting. They were studying our Bill of Rights, the, the legal community was, and, and they wanted to know more about our Second Amendment. And I contribute a piece as well as Professor Joyce what? Malcolm. And uh, so I didn't think what year that was, was that? 2013. Um, ah. uh, the the English version is is posted on the Independent Institute website. Uh, of course, it, it was published in Ukrainian. I've posted the Ukrainian version on my website, stephenharbrook.com, for those who might be interested. Mm. But uh, mm. lo and behold, a year later, um, it was proposed in the <laughs> Ukrainian parliament to adopt a constitutional right to bear arms. And it's it's more detailed than our Second Amendment. And it refers to the right to keep and bear arms and to protect the person, their property, their family, to protect their country, their nation. It also provided for universal military training, not service necessarily, mm-hmm. but training. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the right to protect from oppression. Uh, and that was proposed by the the Speaker of the Parliament, the RADA, R-A-D-A, it's called. And um, then right after that... Oh, wait, let me let me interrupt at that point for clarity. So this is actually at the point where Ukraine had been freed from the Soviet Union, which had more or less disintegrated into its constituent parts. But they had, up to this point, retained more or less the old Soviet-style laws, which forbade gun ownership except to favored people. 
And then right. they're thinking of changing changing the rules at this point when you wrote your article. There, there was an element that. who wanted to change. There's a gun owners association there lobbying in favor of it. Uh, and just days after that was proposed in their parliament, Russia invades the Crimea. And then they go to war and they've got that going on. So it went on the back burner. A lot of things went on the back burner and it never got adopted. And, and there we had, uh, up through current times, the Gun Owners Association was still trying to, uh, and some politicians, some political parties were, were advocating a constitutional guarantee. And Zelensky did not favor that. And um, so he wanted to hold on to the inherited Soviet laws, which limited gun ownership that's, until he changed his mind. Right. And so the day before the invasion came, they knew it was coming. All of a sudden, they're giving out, I think, 25,000 automatic rifles to citizens in Kyiv. And um, all you, you were supposed to give your name. I don't know if they were really checking that closely because it all was done so hurriedly. They also started training people, mind you, a day before the invasion. I mean, think, yeah. you know, well. <clears throat> a day late and a dollar short, but better than never. Um, and citizens mm -hmm. have played a role in, in uh, citizen militias. They've become auxiliaries to the armed forces. I mean, um, I don't know all the ways that the, the Russian generals have been killed, but some have been killed by snipers. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, th I think um, it, it, to the extent that the, uh, the Russians would have gone into a, a major city, um, especially one where part of it was rubble, there would be sharpshooters everywhere. Uh, it'd be like Stalingrad. And right. the defeat of the Germans at Stalingrad, you had a destroyed city, but you had an enormous resistance by men with rifles, basically, and women with rifles. All over the place. Right. So that, that's where we stand. I mean, every day, um, it's gone over two months now. There's been um, over 25,000 Russian soldiers killed, and mm -hmm. the, the Ukrainians have held out beautifully. Um, the ironic part of all this in terms of American politics is that these, the, the same people who want to ban guns here, they're cheering the Ukrainian zone and talking about, yeah. oh boy, they're showing the Russians, they're kicking ass, you know, and uh, right. how great it is that they have arms and they're, and we're sending them more. Let's, you know, send them some more. And, and mass ground roots resistance to the invaders by armed Ukrainians apparently made all the difference in, in the Kiev area and maybe elsewhere in the country, and people are celebrating that. And, and rightly, so, rightly so. Right. One other thing about the implementation of the, or the policy of the, the gun situation there is that a, an ordinary citizen could buy a rifle uh, before the invasion. They could buy an AK type, an AR-15 type, the kind of guns that Joe Biden wants to ban. They could buy those mm -hmm. guns. They handguns were banned. You could only get a handgun that fired a rubber bullet. Um, but you wow. you could buy semi-automatic rifles that now, to the extent um, that they're in, in the hands of citizens, they're being made well use of. One other point, let me mention: um, the, there's these anti-gun uh, world organizations. They they keep track. Um, um, of, of guns. I think gunpolicy.org is one of them. And they talk, talked about, this is before the invasion, um, the, the small number of documented guns, the guns that are registered, uh, and the, the hundreds of thousands of undocumented guns. Sort of like they're talking about undocumented aliens or something. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll tell you what, if I was a Ukrainian, I would want to be an undocumented gun owner because oh, the man, Russians, oh, we already have evidence that when they have invaded certain towns, uh, the first thing they want to get is the list of gun owners and hunters and others. Which the government before that had duly recorded per their own laws restricting and recording gun ownership. And so they were available to the invaders. Right. This happens in every invasion. The, my book on gun control in Nazi-occupied France is exactly about that. Uh, you want to have a gun registration list. If a foreign invasion comes, they're going to get the, the list and they're going to... Uh, they're going to basically shoot the gun owners. That's what they did. And that's what Nazi Germany mm -hmm. did. That's what the Russians are doing. Right. Yeah, that's pretty fascinating. And there, there's some weird resonance. Wasn't there an attempt 
uh, in the post-Civil War period uh, to force uh, the freedmen to register uh, their gun ownership. Uh, at Actually, uh, um, this is detailed in my book, Securing Civil Rights. The black codes replaced the slave codes, and you had the requirement of a license for an African-American, a freed slave, to merely possess a firearm or to carry a firearm. So, so they know who knew knew who which of them had guns. They, they don't not only knew that, but they could deny gun ownership, which which is what they did to most of them. Right, and that was gun control. It was selective gun control, but um, it's obvious now that that was not only racially prejudicial, but really a violation of the the personal right guaranteed in the U.S. Second Amendment. Exactly, and the weird thing about that we we. We're going to talk about the New York case in a few minutes, but the way that the freedmen, the freed slaves were treated is the way ordinary New York citizens are treated now in that state, because it was up to the authorities. This is in the post-Civil War South. It was up to the authorities as to whether a black person could have a gun or carry a gun. And that's exactly the way it is. There's no standard. There was no standard then, and there's no standard now in New York about giving wow. guidance uh you know if you're a law-abiding citizen with training that that doesn't get you the permit you have to show good cause and who good cause come on that's no standard right, at all right well we're going to come there in just a second one last comment on the ukraine thing i was reading your piece that i mentioned before which again is available on our website independent.org uh, and you talked about how at the time when you wrote that piece for the ukraine law journal Support was growing for liberalized gun laws at that time. Now, what caught my attention, of course, as a contemporary American, was the phrase liberalized gun laws. Because that's a confusing phrase in a way. We often think, oh, yeah, the more, the more liberal the gun laws are, the more guns are restricted. Liberal, liberalized law means gun control to the max. But in the Ukrainian context, liberalized gun laws apparently was much more of a real word going back to the root of the word liberal, i.e. liberty, to restore the liberty of gun ownership. That was what liberalized gun laws meant in Ukraine at the time, right? That's the the true meaning of liberalized uh, is less restrictions. The the word has been perverted in in the 20th century and and also today. Um, Think of it this way. Who's the prison lobby (laughs) in, in this country on the gun issue? It's those who want to incarcerate their fe- fellow citizens for mere possession of a firearm when they're a law-abiding people, or they want to put them in prison for five years if if they have a protruding pistol grip on a rifle, uh, the most silly mm-hmm. things, and they want to incarcerate these people, give them felony records. These are liberals? I don't think so. I, yeah. I, I think the word <laughs> reactionary is a good one, or, or you know, statist, authoritarian. Those are good words to describe that philosophy. Yeah, and as you pointed out a few minutes ago, Steve, um, there are plenty of gun control advocates in the United States who are looking far, far, far across the Atlantic and cheering on the Ukrainians. And, you know, and I agree with them, cheer them on. They are mounting, as I called it before, a grassroots resistance, and they're armed. Uh, If they weren't armed, their grassroots resistance wouldn't mean much. And we were cheering them on on the one hand, and then the same people here are saying, well, no, 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 we can't allow widespread gun ownership in the United States the way they do now in Ukraine, because that would be really bad. And maybe we don't have, there's no threats here. There's, there's threats over there where there's no threats Yeah, when well, the reason the there's Americans no threats don't... here is that we have the Second Amendment. We, we have the right to bear arms. We have the right to jury trial. We get to vote. We have free speech. That's why we don't have a domestic tyranny. It, it, if we ha- did not have those rights, you can look at other societies and they lose their liberties. Yeah, absolutely. So let's do a little bit of a historical walk-up, if you don't mind. You are an absolute uh, master of the history of gun ownership and gun laws uh, across the the Atlantic, but also especially here in the early colonies. Uh, Tell us a little bit about the status of gun ownership and how that influenced the, the demand for a Second Amendment, what became the Second Amendment in the U.S. Constitution. Well, the, the, the colonists had to have their own arms to protect themselves to hunt with for other purposes. Jamestown was settled in 1607. Um, the, the, the European immigrants, we'll call them, were 
friendly with many of the Indians tribes. Uh, there were other tribes who it was not the case. Uh, there was a major massacre uh, in Jamestown in, I think, 1621, um, uh, maybe it was. And after that, it was like, whoa, we we have to double down our efforts to make sure every man is armed and he carries arms with him. And so we have uh, something that, that really was uh, inherited from England. If you go back to the early English kings, it was required by law that you have arms based on your social class or what you could afford, down to the lowliest peasant. And so the duty to have arms became the right to have arms, because if you mm-hmm. you have your own archery equipment, if you're like at the lowest level, which is the way it was uh, with the archers and the people who couldn't afford armor, things like that, it's mine. It's my bow, bow and arrows. And we have the same... Uh, concept of both a duty and a right in this country. It, it, look, they require you to have a musket. It's your musket. You use it. You use it for hunting. You use it for personal protection against criminals, against groups of people where you have hostilities between the settlers and the indigenous mm-hmm. tribes. And so um, you you have that same potential concept today where. Um, the government can conscript you or they can or you can maybe volunteer if you're talking about the national guard the armed forces if there's a war or if there's a state protective force like in world war ii citizens came forward with their own arms um either they can encourage you or they can even make you bear arms and at the same time it it it, uh, supports that to have recognized this right to bear arms so where work lay militia being necessary to secure a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Those ideas go together. Verbatim words of the Second Amendment. Yeah, exactly. And so um, the, the, from our colonial society, we became independent through the use of arms. The Americans defeated the most powerful military in the world. Um, and the, the armed citizen played a major role in that. You have... That's a sounding Ukrainian. Oh, Yeah. Uh, and, and you know what? Nobody thought that war would last long. The Brits thought they were going to defeat the Americans really quickly. Putin thought the same thing. Now he's got a bloody nose. He doesn't have victories to show for his efforts uh, in, in the big holiday. Um, and he wants to celebrate the defeat of Nazi Germany, and he's exact, behaving exactly like Nazi Germany. Mm-hmm. So in, in any case, we have this as our, our heritage. Um, th- this freedom that we have to keep and bear arms. It's a unique, uniquely American-recognized freedom. Even before the Constitution is the point that this was the practice and understood law of the colonies. Look, the first state um, declaration of rights when the states declared their independence in 1776 was that of Pennsylvania, Mm -hmm. and it protected the right of the people to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state. Mm-hmm. Vermont had the same language. North Carolina, Massachusetts adopted right to bear arms provisions. They're they're older, obviously, than the Second Amendment. They preceded the Constitution. The Constitution right. gets the- adopted, uh, or rather, gets a proposed in seventeen eighty seven. It doesn't have a Bill of Rights. So then you have this debate. The Federalists said it doesn't need a Bill of Rights because the people are armed. There can never be a tyranny. And the Anti Federalists said. Yeah, we want all this in writing. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not good <laughs> right. enough just to have a written guarantees don't necessarily last unless you can back it up. So, but you need they, both. So, they exactly, got both. Exactly. They got both. But what's fascinating to me in your account um, in this remarkable book, uh, The Right to Bear Arms, which I highly recommend, um, in that book, I think you recount how there was, um, you know, a dispute at the time in 1787, whether a Bill of Rights should be added and what should it include and so forth. Um, the right was uh, to bear arms already protected in, in the various colonies become states. But um, there was still a conversation about it. And you, you documented that the demand for uh, a right to bear arms was initially strongest in the northern states, which, which is where anti-slavery and abolition sentiment, even at that time, was the strongest, and that initially the support for the right to bear arms in the U.S. Bill of Rights was weaker in the southern states, 
which of course were concerned about undermining their slave power. Um, have I got that right, Steve? Look, um, in the 1990s, there was a, a theory concocted by Professor Carl Bogus uh, that the Second Amendment was adopted to protect slavery. It sounds like the opposite. And, yeah, and so what actually happened, I, I have a major law review article. It's actually on the SSRN now, but Georgetown um, Journal of, of Law and Politics will be publishing it in the near future. Uh, look, the impetus for, the, for what became the Second Amendment was basically from the northern states. They were wanting to protect the, the right to keep and bear arms. That was the right that won the Americans' independence. There was also strong sentiment for that right in the southern states because of the issue of they want to protect against invasion and domestic tyranny. There was a minority of people in the southern states that didn't want any kind of Bill of Rights because it would recognize, the, if you say, the right of the people. I mean, look, you have slavery. Um, so that undermined slavery to have a declaration of rights. And there was one specific person that articulated it in those very words. And, and in any case, the, the theory that was invented to denigrate the Second Amendment really got it the opposite. Uh, the impetus came from the states that were also um, abolishing slavery and the process of abolishing slavery or having already done so. In fact, the, the Vermont Constitution of 1777 both declared the right to bear arms and abolish slavery. So, you know, it, it's yeah, a, all in the same breath. And because they really were two sides of the same coin, because as you pointed out in your book, Securing Civil Rights, which I'm just holding up here, uh, which you subtitled Freedmen, the 14th Amendment and the Right to Bear Arms, securing the newly announced rights uh, for all Americans after the Civil War did entail the necessity of bearing arms. Right. Because, you know, the, the Dred Scott decision said, whoa. If you recognize citizenship among African Americans, they can have the right to free speech and they can keep and carry arms wherever they went. It was like, you don't want them to have that, so you, you, we're not going to recognize their citizenship. But what the 14th Amendment did, ratified in 1668, was to recognize the rights of all people to these fundamental protections that are in the Bill of Rights. And the Second Amendment. 1868. Yeah, the Second Amendment was one of those rights that uh, was actually discussed even more than free speech and between the enactment of the Black Code starting in 1865 and then the ratification of the 14th Amendment in uh, 1868. Mm -hmm. So, so when, I, when I've seen some uh, of our African-American fellow citizens uh, wearing a sh shirt saying, Black Guns Matter, they're actually standing in an old tradition. Oh, absolutely. Not? Look, if you were a Black person in the South, let's say, you wanted arms for protection. Uh, there was mm -hmm. the, the KKK, those kinds of attacks were going on. And, and you wanted it for survival. The, the same muskets that they, uh, the Union soldiers who were African-American bought from the government when they, uh, their enlistments ended after the war ended, they used them for hunting game as well as personal protection. And this was all discussed. In, in the debates, um, the Freedmen's Bureau Act, and then on the 14th mm -hmm. Amendment Civil Rights Act of 1866, uh, freedom entailed be, having that right to bear arms. It was very important to African Americans to secure their, their liberation that way. So those rights were secured, um, at least at law, um, and the, the right and freedom to carry firearms was well established uh, in English history, in colonial history. Um, established in the Second Amendment, uh, reinforced uh, at the time of uh, the Civil War and uh, overcoming slavery. It was a key part of liberating former slaves and making them full-fledged citizens. This has a pretty long and storied history, the right to bear arms. And yet, uh, when did the tide seem to reverse? I think the tide has gone back come the dawn of the 21st century, but it sure seems that in the 20th century, uh, the advocates of gun control have made a lot of inroads on the right to bear arms. Why that uh, turn, the anti-liberalizing turn, to use the phrase correctly? Any thoughts about that? Well, you see uh, in certain 19th century laws, uh, for example, it was not an offense at common law to carry a, a concealed weapon. Uh, a minority of states, mostly southern states, made it an offense, but you could still carry openly. Um, 
in the northern states up until the turn of the century, you could basically carry a gun openly or concealed and it was not a crime. In fact, New Jersey didn't ban uh, carrying openly firearms until 1966. Wow. But yeah. the, the tide really turned because of prohibition. The, the organized crime oh. that was generated by alcohol prohibition led to the first federal law on, this, on guns, basically, the National Firearms Act. And, and all they're talking about is the, um, the John Dillinger and, and their, the, 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 you know, the rum smugglers and everything. That was the impetus for the National Firearms Act. They wanted to restrict pistols and revolvers. That got taken out of the act. But in any event, that, that act survives to this very day. And then in the 1960s, because of the different things going on, there was the, um, the political assassinations, uh, the riots, um, anti-war unrest. Um, some people thought the country was falling apart. So why don't we enact the Federal Gun Control Act of 19... 19- 68. Uh, mm-hmm. You had an attempt, though, by those extremists, those who were extreme supporters of that, to require all guns to be registered at the federal level. And that got wow. defeated over and over. And in fact, right. uh, it's prohibited by federal law to for an agency to register guns, to register uh, guns of ordinary people. So, you know, what's, fasc- what's fascinating about this uh, kind of historical account, and we're going to come up to the present next, but what's fascinating to me historically uh, is that uh, the uh, resurgence or the, the surge of gun control and gun restricting laws in the mid to late 20th century was a reaction to various factors, as you noted. Um, it seems really likely plausible to say it was reactionary that the, the support for gun control laws was a kind of reactionary surge in response to certain events, which then finally, uh, by the turn of the 21st century, the U.S. Supreme Court itself uh, in the D.C. versus Heller case seemed to uh, herald a turning of the tide. Uh, can you tell us about that case in brief and how it leads to the current day? Exactly. Um, the, the, the Supreme Court had never said much about the Second Amendment. Uh, it, it took a long time to talk about it for one reason. There was there were no federal laws on this subject. There was a very brief decision on the National Firearms Act. The Supreme Court decided a case called U.S. versus Miller in 1939. And it basically suggested that militia arms are protected under the Second Amendment. Even you don't have to be in a militia, but if it's a militia type arm that that had a kind of an old legal history because of requirements that people that people join the militia and provide their own arms. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it Mm -hmm. developed into recognition of a a right to those same arms. Uh, But then there was not much about that. And we didn't really have gun bans in in the U S we had different restrictions. Um, Handguns though were banned in the district of Columbia and in, in Chicago and some other Chicago land jurisdictions. And so finally in 2008, the Supreme Court took on that issue in a major way. A wonderful opinion written by Justice Scalia held that the Second Amendment, as you would think, uh, protects an individual right, the right of the people, hello, uh, to keep and bear arms. It is not some kind of elusive metaphysical collective right that belongs to nobody, which was a, a theory that had been propagated beginning in the 1960s to try to that reactionary time uh, exactly um <laughs> and it was to 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 try to argue that, that nobody has second amendment rights so there's no limits to the gun bans that can be passed so um the the determination by justice scalia's 5-4 decision was that individuals have that right and you can not simply ban firearms uh it, it adopted a test that the kinds of arms that the American people choose that are commonly possessed by law-abiding people for lawful purposes or that are typically possessed by Americans for those purposes, those are protected by the Second Amendment. So it's the people who decide what kind of arms that the Second Amendment protects. It's not the government. Mm. Mm-hmm. The Bill of Rights is to protect us against the government. The, the, the idea that the government decides what your Bill of Rights protections are 
is was completely anathema to the whole idea of the whole enterprise of a Bill of Rights. St. George Tucker wrote in the first commentaries on the Constitution in 1803 that the purpose of a Bill of Rights is so the person with even the least understanding or the least education would understand when his rights are being violated, would understand what the rights are and when they're being mm -hmm. violated, and could take action to protect them. Uh, I am imagining that um, in the 2008 case that you were mentioning, the Heller case, um, could it be that somebody on the court, or at least advising the court, had read books by Stephen Halbrook on the subject? Um, th one of my books was cited in the, the case, and there, there was other research that I did that over the years that um, filtered out and by myself and other scholars. Uh, I don't take credit for all of that. Uh, but, but Well, I appreciate you being modest, but let's just say that you are a notable scholar in this area and your findings have mattered. Thank you. There was a case called uh, Sheriff J. Prince versus United States, one of the cases I argued where the court invalidated part of the Brady Act because it tried to impose federal duties on state and local officials. And in a concurring mm. opinion in that case, Justice Thomas cited my book, That Every Man Be Armed, The Evolution of a Constitutional Right. Oh, interesting. And, yeah. and then the, um, uh, when, during the Bush administration, uh, W. Bush, um, the, you, the Justice Department under Attorney General John Ashcroft changed the Justice Department's dis, um, interpretation of the Second Amendment to, uh, in, in conformity with its original intent, that it protects individual rights. And, uh, and in conformity with those recent Supreme Court rulings. <clears throat> The, and this was this preceded the Supreme Court rulings. Oh, it preceded. Yes, it. this, this oh, was okay. this was okay. the early nineteen uh, nineties. Oh yeah, yeah. Of and course, right. and With, so, um, or I'm sorry, the early two thousands. And yeah. mm -hmm. and so the Justice Department changed its tune, and uh, the the ideas, you know, became the standard model academically. And so, so I wonder what was New York State thinking when in the Still, in, in the light of the Heller case and later reinforced by the McDonald versus Chicago case in 2010, what was New York thinking when they thought they could persist in having these what you call discretionary issue laws that are now the subject of the current of the current case? What were they thinking? Well, let's go how back to get, how could they think they could get away well, with let's it? Let's go back. To, they haven't changed the law since it, it was first enacted, basically, in, in 1911, the so-called Sullivan Law. Big Tim mm. Sullivan, uh, a friend of the Irish mob. I mean, they they won their elections by hook or crook. And uh, the whole idea was to require law-abiding people to get a, a license, to even to have a, a handgun in your own home. Uh, and also, mm. they enacted the discretionary license issuance policy where the, the police could decide who got licenses to carry handguns and who did not. Um, it was part of it was in reaction to their their hatred of uh, immigrants, particularly Italian immigrants as well. Mm -hmm. the, the very first person convicted under that, under that law, they the judge chewed him out and, and made references to your kind uh, carrying mm -hmm. guns. And the, the guy carried a gun because he was afraid of the black hand, uh, uh, a, a, a gangster group that preyed upon Italian Americans. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the New York Times praised that decision and basically said these Italian people, they need to have a lesson taught to, to, taught to them. They need to be incarcerated, wow. put them in Sing Sing. And, and so after the Heller decision, though, in 2008, did New York look at its laws and think about, well, gee whiz. Um, yeah, I would have said to myself, huh, maybe we should revisit this law. No, they haven't done anything. If anything, they've only made their laws worse. Uh, their, their laws banning modern rifles, which they call derogatorily assault weapons. Uh, they, they've made all of their laws worse. And, and if you um, want to carry a handgun for protection, if you're in New York City, um, if you're a billionaire, you might get a license. Or if you're a celebrity, some movie star, or if you pay the right bribes. Look, the, the the police and the licensing division who give out the licenses were busted two and three years ago for for getting money, prostitutes, 
ball game tickets to give out handgun wow. licenses. If you're just an wow. ordinary Joe Blow, you don't get one. And one thing Justice Scalia, uh, I'm sorry, Justice Alito asked in the oral argument back in November was that if you're an ordinary worker, let, let's say you're um, in the service industry, you're low paid, you get off work late at night in New York City, you got to go through the subway to get home. You you don't get a permit to carry, do you? And and the answer was mm-hmm. no. And and um, the New York lawyer said, well, uh, nobody has guns. And Justice Alito said, yeah, what are the criminals? And she said, oh, yeah, they do. And then she just pivoted to, well, uh, under English law, you had to have the king's license to, to have a gun. I, I mean, look, they're still thinking in uh-huh. terms of this royalty you know, like yeah, the, that's telling. Oh, oh yeah, that was very telling. You know, this is I, this is a very short distraction here or diversion, but I can't help but thinking of a totally different subject, but has a similar character. Namely, mm-hmm. I believe that in New York City, uh, during the height of the COVID restrictions, uh, there were mandates that you that events and um, people and groups had to either have you know vaccination status. Uh, and masking and uh, so forth. But there was an exemption granted for uh, star athletes and performers uh, to some of those COVID-related restrictions in New York City. And of course, some people said, wait, that's not fair. Uh, and then I think the, the mayor said, understandably, well, I mean, these people are, you know, they're well protected and they bring in a lot yeah. of business and, and so forth. <laughs> so I'm thinking New York State, wow, discretionary issuance laws. And this is what's under under question in the case. I'll play devil's advocate for half a half a second on that. So somebody might say, Steve, that, okay, yeah, I know it was a, it was a bad idea for New York to deny uh, licenses to Italians and give them to others, and a bad idea to, to give licenses to hold carry guns to people who are influential or rich or whatever, bribes. But the, the problem is it's just a misuse of the discretionary issuance law. Um, you know, and if the discretionary issuance law weren't misused, it would be a good thing because then we could just keep, you know, we could make good decisions about who gets these licenses rather than these discriminatory decisions. So aren't you really against the discriminatory character of it or are you really against the whole idea of discretionary issuance? But the, the very concept of discretionary issuance indicates discrimination and choosing one, some people over other people. Uh, that's inherent. The alternative to that, which exists in 44 states, is that it, uh, if a license is required, because not every state even requires a license to carry, but to the extent that licenses um, are standards are set forth in state law, it's very reasonable. You have to have um, lack of a criminal record, lack of like mental commitments, things like that. Uh, you have to, in some cases, have some kind of training not onerous training, but some training. And if you get, uh, fulfill those requirements, you get the license to carry. They don't look at, oh, under my arbitrary subjective value judgments, do I think you really need to carry a gun? I mean, it's in the constitution. (laughs) You don't have to show a need. So this is 44 Mm -hmm. states. The sky has not fallen in those states. Um, you you have six states with these this discretionary issuance. Um, it's the usual nanny states, the usual suspects: California, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Hawaii, you know, New York. Um, those those are the states that restrict everything. The states that many people are fleeing from, and and so that it boils down to. And, and this was very much part of the oral argument, and when the case was. Um, deliberated on in, in November was how do you just des- decide who gets it and who doesn't? Um, is there any, uh, Justice Sotomayor even asked, is there any other constitutional right like that? Ooh. That you have to ask permission to the government to exercise that right? Justice Kagan asked it also. Wow. Uh, just going back half a step, Steve, um, the, the states, the 44 states that are not guilty of this kind of you know, invalid uh, discretionary thing. Um, what if someone like, I, I don't understand all of it myself, but somebody might ask, uh, well, yeah, you're saying that in those states, 
they issue licenses to some people and not others, the ones who have that special training and so forth. Isn't that discretionary issuance? What, what discretionary issuance means that an official decides whether he thinks you need to have a gun. And the and where you do have these requirements like lack of a criminal record or training, it's objective. Yeah. It's not discretionary. It, no, any, anybody can can fulfill those requirements. It's called shall issue instead of may issue. But I have to also mm -hmm. say half of those states now have what they call constitutional carry where you don't even have to get a permit or a license to carry a concealed handgun. You can just do it. Uh, it, it no license issuance at all. In that right. Case. And so that's becoming more and more prevalent. It's almost half the states now <clears throat> that recognize that. And, and the whole basis of that is that that's the way our country was founded, that you didn't have to have a permit uh, to to carry a gun. It's still against the law, like if you're a, a violent felon, to possess a gun in those states. Um, and so those kind of people violate the laws anyway, because they violate the more major laws, much less the more minor right, ones. Exactly. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense to have these penalties uh, to penalize law-abiding people for for right. carrying a gun for lawful purposes. Uh, so it's one thing to have neutral, uh, objectively definable criteria that would apply to everyone one way or the other, training or criminal record and so forth. It's something else entirely for the authorities to have actually discretion on uh, issuing these licenses as they wish. And that's what New York is trying to defend, right? Exactly. Um, uh, it's always hazardous to predict how a case is going to come out. I think it's more likely than not that the Supreme Court will invalidate New York's law. There's a total of six states that have laws like that. Um, I, that's that's going to basically wipe out a sentence in their their gun licensing schemes. They don't have to rewrite their laws. It, right. it just has to be like in the case of New York, if the S Supreme Court invalidates this this good cause requirement, that's no longer the law. But all the other things are still the law. One thing that came up, for example, in the oral argument was, and, and the Independent Institute did an amicus brief with the court on this very issue was are there cer certain places called sensitive places where guns can be banned from private possession and and the answer is there's a, a narrowly defined type of um places like that like a court for example guns can be banned in the court and in the courthouse and and notice the context normally today there's metal detectors there's there, mm -hmm. whether even if they don't have that, they have security. They have the sheriff's bailiffs, sheriff's deputies protecting people. So if you want to have a a tiny gun free zone, you need to provide protection in it, because if you just declare ordinary citizens can't have a gun there, it's just going to invite criminals to do right. that and and mass attacks, things like that. But it's sort of like, hey, here's where all the victims are. Exactly. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, y'all come, you know, here, here, here's the place. Um, so the, the Second Amendment uh, guarantees that Congress shall not make a law infringing the right of the people to bear arms. The 14th Amendment makes the states accountable to that same principle. This case is about the question of whether New York's restriction violates that, that rule, that constitutional uh, provision. Uh, I think that if it's a constitutional right of the people, not just of the privileged few to bear arms, then it could only be restricted if uh, it could survive strict scrutiny by the court. Am I right? That's how the court talks about constitutional rights. They have to be vindicated if they're constitutional rights, unless they can survive a very strict scrutiny uh, on some restriction. Well, there's, Is this a strict scrutiny well, case? Well, there's, there's two models that what's... What the court developed in Heller, and it, and is also applied in other cases, is a, is a, a jurisprudence of text, history, and tradition. Um, the problem with strict scrutiny and w what most courts have been doing when they uphold these laws, it, they they apply what they call intermediate scrutiny, 
Uh, but the problem with those tests that I think more justices are recognizing is it's a balancing test. Even with strict scrutiny, something can be banned if, if there's a so-called compelling state interest. Well, you can always think up some compelling state interests like crime control or whatever. And so what mm-hmm. the court did in Heller and the, and the court's increasingly doing is applying text, history, and tradition. So with the Second mm-hmm. Amendment, the text is a no-brainer. You don't really need to do much else. But what Heller did was to describe the history and tradition preceding the adoption of the Second Amendment and then after its adoption, especially in the early years after its adoption, and where the court showed that the practices were consistent with what the text tells you anyway. And that's why the, the court really talked about the history and tradition all the way up through Reconstruction, b- because you still had that... Um, predominant idea that the Second Amendment protects individuals, uh, that it's, it's a, a right for all people, uh, for self-defense, defense against tyranny, invasion, things like that. So you wouldn't look at 20th century history and tradition, because that doesn't tell you anything about the, the text as originally understood, um, the, the, the common understanding of, of the right to keep and bear arms, for example. So. We'll see where the court goes on that. I, th- I think that certainly a, a law like New York does, has, does not pass strict scrutiny. Uh, I mm-hmm. think it's more likely than not the court is going to apply the text history and tradition test because you, you can see where levels of scrutiny um, c- can lead a court to I- I introduce personal preferences and value judgments because mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. a balancing test. And so is it really, really important or is it really, really important that the government interest prevails or is that liberty really important? So it's it's fascinating to me that maybe this New York State Rifle and Pistol Association case could be an occasion for the court to add further logic and clarity um, because this whole three tiered scrutiny system is simply a court developed doctrine. Um, It's not in the text of the Constitution. And if they're going to go back to text, uh, tradition, and history, uh, if I got the three right, text, tradition, and history, uh, that would be a lot more intelligible than this very complex three-tiered scrutiny system. Maybe the court will take a step toward intelligibility and clarity by getting away from the levels of scrutiny thing. During the oral argument in the Heller case, Chief Justice Roberts asked Walter Dellinger, who was the counsel for the District of Columbia, um, uh, let me mention Walter. He was a, a colleague who argued, he was a solicitor general under, um, under Clinton, and he argued the Prince case. I argued the other side, our side won. Uh, he just died recently, but he was a real gentleman. But he, Ro- just, Chief Justice Roberts asked Walter this question, like, didn't we kind of make this stuff up about levels of scrutiny? <laughs> Uh, uh-huh. Isn't it? Sh- I mean, the Second Amendment says the right shall not be infringed upon. Shouldn't we just like ask? Is it or is it a handgun ban an infringement of the right to keep and bear arms? Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, the Chief Justice made the very point that you just made. Like these these judicially invented levels um, of scrutiny, you don't need them. I mean, the First Amendment talks about rights not being abridged or that no law shall be made uh, abridging mm-hmm. certain rights. And so just use the plain language. So Stephen Halbrick, you have given good advice to uh, the Ukrainians uh, and it looks like they may have added, profited from it. You've been giving good advice to the Americans. Um, we are going to come back to you and talk to you again after this case decision is issued. Uh, when do you anticipate the court will uh, let its ruling be revealed? Well, they put off the most controversial cases to the end of June. That's the end of the term. And the, mm-hmm. They tried to put off another controversial case. Yeah. It seemed to have gotten leaked. Yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> the reason they do that is they want to make the decision as good as possible, and they want to give the ch- a chance to other justices who maybe want to write concurring or dissenting opinions yeah. to, to mm-hmm. write their opinions in in the best possible light. And so it yeah. really works well to put these off uh, till the end of the term, the, 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 the most difficult cases, the ones that are more controversial, uh, because it gives all the justices a chance to 
set forth their their views in the most developed way possible. Well, we'll be standing by uh, for that news uh, probably toward the end of June 2022, and there'll be more to say. In the meanwhile, I do invite people to get a copy of this book by Stephen Holbrook, The Right to Bear Arms, uh, Constitutional Right of the People or of the Privilege of the Ruling Class. Uh, worth checking out. It's available at our website, Independent. Dot org. Thank you for all the work you've done on this subject, Steve. Well, thank you, Graham, for having me and appreciate the program. And I, I look forward to when the decision comes down to rejoining you. We will talk again for sure. And thank you to all those who join us in watching this program. I do invite you to visit the Independent Institute website, independent.org. On this topic and many others, we try and assemble for you quite an archive of resources that are evidence-based and analytical and that seek to vindicate uh, liberty and good order. Uh, and with that said, thanks for everybody. Thanks to Stephen Hallbrook. See you next time on Independent Conversation. Bye-bye.